All right, welcome everyone to another Wednesday webinar. Um, we wanna thank the Northern Colorado Libraries, Loveland Library and Clearview Library specifically for helping us host these webinars for you guys. Thank you all for registering and joining us today. We've got a really great topic. Um, before we get started, I just wanna let you know that we will be recording. Um, you will receive an email after, maybe in the next week or so um, with some links, useful links and, and a link to that recording as well. If you have questions throughout today's webinar, you can pop those into the chat box. Um, Allison and I are gonna be in the background. That's my coworker, Allison in Larimer County. And um, we'll be in the background giving our best attempt to answer those questions, but we'll also save some of those and hopefully have time um, to ask our presenter at the end. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Sheila Beckley. She is with the Weld County Extension Office and she is their family and consumer science agent. And today she is going to teach you about storing, cleaning and preparing vegetables. So Sheila, take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amy and Allison. <clears throat> this is uh, just my second time to be with this group and I really appreciate being here today. Uh, it's a great community and glad to be able to uh, present something for this series and always great turnout for you guys. So that's so awesome. Um, <clears throat> before I begin, I just wanted to ask if, uh, how many people here who are here from Weld County? Anybody from Weld County? You can just maybe, um, <clears throat> um, I don't know. Let's see. We probably need to remove the sharing of the screen so we can see. Maybe you can raise your hand physically or you can do the uh, reactions where it's a, if there's a thumbs up over there or something like that. I'd be curious how many people are from Weld County. I got one, just one, <laughs> okay, cool. Anybody from Larimer County? Okay, I've got a couple Larimer, anyone from Boulder County? Boulder, okay, yeah, a few also from Boulder. How about everyone else, where are you guys from? If you can put it in a chat box, chat box, that would be great. Morgan, Denver, Fremont, Eagle, Denver, Adams, Jefferson, Adams. Wow, wow. Well, this is really great. We're all over the front range and even beyond. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> So um, let's see, if you planted anything this season, could you type them also in the chat box? I'm curious what you have planted. Uh, my family and I traveled in May and uh, so we didn't get anything down in the ground until June, but we planted the ever present zucchini. But we also are trying black tomatoes again because my son loves black tomatoes. Uh, we have a lettuce, snow peas, three kinds of kale and some herbs. So let's see, what do you guys have? Oops. Cucumbers, potatoes. We've always wanted to try potatoes, but we're a little bit intimidated about that. Even after talking with Amy Lentz, how to do it. <laughs> so I'm still like, hmm. Carrots, reddish, yellow, wax beans, kale, broccoli, heirloom, tomatoes. Yeah, heirloom tomatoes are really worth it because they're so expensive. The Boulder uh, Farmer's Market, they were $6 a pound. Oh my goodness. We got three tomatoes for eight bucks. <laughs> so, but anyway, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, <clears throat> as we have said, our objectives for today are the following. How to store vegetables and preserve their quality how to clean vegetables so they're safe, their food safety, um, and then some easy breezy food preparation techniques. So let's start with storing. So I'll be talking about storing vegetables in the refrigerator, freezer, and cool room temperature only. I will not be talking about other food preparation techniques such as pickling, canning, or dehydration as a means of storing food. Uh, but 
I'll be teaching food preservation techniques pretty soon, like canning and so forth. Some of them may be online, so anyone will be able to access. Some will be in person. So those who may be from Weld, please do check my webpage. I have a calendar there with all my classes. Uh, I will put a link in the chat box at the end of this class. And then for those who are not from Weld County, you're also welcome, of course, if you don't mind driving a bit. Uh, but we have agents across the state who are certified in food preservation techniques. So. Um, you can check out their uh, web pages as well and look at their questions. I mean, look at their classes. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions about these classes. So um, fruits and vegetables, uh, in particular, we're going to talk about vegetables today, can be stored long after the season is over when they are handled and stored properly. The important aspects to proper storage are temperature humidity and ventilation. Uh, you wanna separate the fruits and vegetables in storage because a good number of fruits emit ethylene, which helps in the ripening, but then they also make other vegetables go bad quicker. Um, some vegetables and fruits are better stored at a cool room temperature like tomatoes. However, if they have been already cut, peeled or sliced, they must be kept in the refrigerator for food safety. Okay, so we have some general storage guidelines to retain quality and the nutrition or nutritive value. Stock only the kinds and quantity that you can store properly. Make sure to, um, what are you going to stock? Well, make sure to vary your veggies by their color. Um, <clears throat> There are five main groupings. There's the green, like green leafy vegetables and broccoli and asparagus. The yellow and orange vegetables, those are the yellow squash, pumpkin, butternut squash, carrots. The red vegetables, like red bell peppers and tomatoes. The blue and purple, like purple cabbage and eggplant. And the white and brown vegetables, like onions, cauliflower, garlic, garlic, leeks, parsnips, and mushrooms. So can't help putting on a little bit of um, nutrition over there. Um, keep your refrigerator and freezer clean. Keep all other areas where you store your vegetables clean. Keep your raw meats from contaminating your vegetables by putting them away from your vegetables. Put them below the vegetables um, or and ready to eat food, either below or away. If you have a separate compartment for meats, definitely use that. Um, some vegetables are better stored at a cool room temperature, as I've said, and some are better stored in the fridge. Now, different vegetables need different storage conditions. Temperature and humidity are the main storage factors to consider. There are three combinations for long-term storage. The first one is cool and dry. 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 60% 60, 60 relative humidity. So that would be kind of like your basement. Number two, cold and dry. 32 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 65% relative humidity. That would be your refrigerator uh, on the upper shelves. The third one is the cold and moist, which is 32 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's also your refrigerator and 95% relative humidity. So that's the most humid. That would be your vegetable crisper drawer on the bottom. So for cold conditions, 32 degrees is in fact the ideal temperature. This temperature though is not easy to attain in most homes. Expect shortened shelf lives for vegetables as storage conditions deviate from these ideal temperatures. This shortening of their lifespan can be up to 25% for every 10 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. <clears throat> Oops, okay. So home refrigerators are generally cold and dry. They can vary from 32 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 to 60 degrees relative, I mean, 50 to 60 degrees fair, uh, percent, excuse me, relative humidity. Putting vegetables in perforated plastic bags in the refrigerator will provide cold and moist conditions, but only for a moderate amount of time. Unperforated plastic bags which are generally the ones we get from the store, 
often create too much humidity. It leads to condensation and the growth of mold or bacteria. Now, the CRISPR drawer is for vegetables that are better stored at colder temperatures and require high humidity. Some refrigerators have a sliding humidity setting, just like this one over here. When it's closed, um, then it's in the high humidity setting. And then when it's open, and then there's more airflow within that drawer, then it's a low humidity setting. If your drawer doesn't have a variable setting, then it's always on high humidity. Now, refrigerators are generally set by the manufacturers to 37 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if your refrigerator does not have a thermometer built in, you may want to get one of those inexpensive refrigerator thermometers to make sure that your refrigerator is actually at the right temperature. And for home refrigerators, maximum is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. For commercial restaurant refrigerators, it's 41. However, most everybody want to set it at 37 to 38. Now, the entire temperature does not have that exact temperature in every shelf or every nook and cranny in the refrigerator. It's a bit more nuanced. So the lower shelves and towards the back are the coldest areas. Um, towards the door, it's going to be warmer. And then the door shelves are the warmest uh, areas in the fridge. <clears throat> Now you wanna keep your fruit and vegetables in separate drawers. If, especially if you have two of them, make use of those because other vegetables like leafy greens, they are ethylene sensitive and may cause them to ripen quick, quicker. So keep them in the crisper drawer with the higher humidity. They like that, but then separate the ones that, um, especially the fruits. Okay, so which vegetables prefer colder temperatures and which don't? We can take our cue from how the grocery stores sell their produce in some ways. Those vegetables that they mist with water at regular intervals are the ones that require high humidity. Those would be the leafy greens that we have seen, the asparagus, sometimes also carrots and celery. Those can be placed in the crisper drawer. However, if they are dripping wet, as when sometimes they can be after they got misted at the grocery store, when you get home, pat them with paper towels so they don't just rest and soak in the water and get all moldy in the refrigerator during storage. Now, here is a list of common fruits and vegetables and their ideal storage temperature and relative humidity. There's also the approximate storage life or shelf life. I'll give you a link later so you can access a copy of this at the end. So <clears throat> here's the vegetables. You can see over here, most of them are in the 30. So that's the refrigerator. So you can place them in the crisper drawer. The ones that are a little bit higher, like 32 to 40, and so forth, you may wanna put them on the upper shelves, but towards the door, not towards the back, but towards the door, especially if you're running out of room in the crisper drawer. And some of the vegetables um, that say 50 to 60 around that temperature, those are gonna be at room temperature. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. All right, as I said, I will be able, I will give you a copy of this or at least the access to, so you can have a copy of this. Next, we're gonna look at um, how to store herbs such as cilantro and parsley in the refrigerator. Let me just increase my volume. Okay, here it is. I'm here in the kitchen and today I'm going to teach you how to store some herbs. Now we have fresh cilantro and fresh parsley here and those are two different ways to store them in the refrigerator if you're not going to use them immediately. The first one is to put it in a cup or a vase if you have one with a little bit of water. To do this we're going to chop off the end of the stems 
so that the parsley can absorb the water better. So we're just gonna put it in the water and put it on the top shelf of the refrigerator. Keep it away from the back so it doesn't freeze. The next way to store herbs is to use a wet paper towel. We're gonna do the same thing by chopping off the ends of the cilantro here. Take the wet paper towel and wrap it around the stems of the cilantro. And then we're gonna put it in a zip top bag so that the air can't get to it. And the wet paper towel is gonna to keep it nice and moist. So we're just gonna stick it right in here, and seal the top of the bag closed. The best place to store the herbs, if they're in a bag like this, is in the produce drawer in the refrigerator. Okay, so the important thing to remember here, um, if you're going to put it in that Ziploc bag, um, like the second version, you want to make sure that the leaves are actually not um, soaking wet. If they happen to be, you know, kind of really wet, we want to pat them dry so they don't get moldy or soggy and, and so forth. Okay, so um, now let's move on to storing in the freezer. So if you want to freeze vegetables, you want to wash them first, then slice according to what you plan to use them for. Most vegetables are better blanched before freezing with a few exceptions, and those are tomatoes, onions, um, and peppers. You can then place them on a tray in one layer or in small clumps for an hour and then transfer them into freezer bags. So that way your vegetable pieces will not freeze into one solid block and you can just take out as much as you need at a time. You wanna press out excess air as much as you can to prevent freezer burn and um, make sure that the freezer bags that you use are actually the ones that are for freezer, not the storage bags because the storage bags are a bit more, I think porous um, so you want to use the freezer bags and they're also thicker. This will preserve the quality of your vegetables and also prevent freezer burns. Here we're going to watch a video from University of Maine Extension and she's going to demonstrate how to blanch vegetables before freezing. I'm Kathy Savoy, Extension Educator with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Today we're going to talk about how you can take advantage of all those great local Maine greens that are available in your own backyard, farmer's market, or farm stand. In general, greens are loaded with nutrients including vitamin A and K, folate, calcium, iron, many phytochemicals, and fiber. Freezing is a simple, inexpensive, and very quick method of food preservation. Greens such as spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens, collard, kale, turnip or mustard greens freeze very well. Blanching pot, ice bath, colander, salad spinner, paper towels, towel, tray, cutting board and knife. Materials to freeze in need to be moisture vapor resistant, durable and leak proof, not become brittle and crack at low temperatures, and also protect foods from developing off flavors or odors. They also need to be easy to seal and easy to mark. Many greens are widely available and easy to find here in Maine. They include spinach, beet greens, kale, dinosaur variety, kale, curly type variety, Swiss chard, and a braising greens mix. Select young tender greens. Wash thoroughly and cut off woody stems. You can either leave greens whole or chopped. Plan ahead and consider how you will be using the frozen product. Blanching, scalding vegetables in boiling water or steam for a specific amount of time is a must for almost all vegetables before they're frozen. Exceptions include tomatoes, peppers, and onions. Blanching stops enzyme action, which can cause loss of flavor, loss of color and texture. Blanching helps remove surface dirt and organisms, brightens the color and helps stop the loss of vitamins. Greens require two minutes of water blanching with the exception of collards that require three minutes. Use a blancher pot, which has a blanching basket and cover or fit a wire basket into a large pot with a lid. 
Work in small batches and use one gallon of water per pound of prepared vegetables. Lower vegetables into vigorously boiling water. Once the water returns to a boil, start counting the blanching time. As soon as the blanching is complete, quickly cool greens to stop the cooking process. Plunge greens into an ice bath for the same amount of time they were blanched for, two minutes. To improve the quality of your frozen product, remove water by spinning in a salad spinner, placing on paper towels or clean towels. Excess water creates clumped greens that are hard to break up and use and can cause a loss of quality. Pack into freezer grade material, remove as much air as possible and leave a half an inch of headspace for the expansion that occurs during freezing. Label date and freeze in your freezer that's set at zero degrees. Greens can be frozen using the tray method in individual clumps. Greens and other frozen vegetables should be used within eight months. Frozen greens can be used in your favorite recipes, including soups, stews, casseroles, gumbos, or even simply served as a side dish to accompany any of your meals. UMaine Cooperative Extension is your go-to resource for the latest USDA recommendations for home canning, freezing, and drying. Check out our website for food preservation information, including hands-on preserving the harvest workshops near you, publications from our Let's Preserve series, books, pressure gauge testing services, and more. Okay. So um, let me look at the chat. Let's see if there are any questions. Oh, okay, great. So I just wanted to add that you could also label them with the quantity, say it's the bag has two cups or one cup or whatever, or maybe by weight, especially if um, you have particular recipes that you're thinking of that require certain amounts, um, or you can label them. This is going to be, this spinach is going to be for your quiche. This spinach is going to be for like that. And maybe some of them are chopped finer than the others. So you can add a lot of those labels so you know already what they are going to be for. Okay. Um, any questions? while I'm moving my slides here. Does anybody have any questions? Nothing in the chat right now, Sheila. All right, sounds good. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, with regards to your herbs, and they do go bad rather quickly, um, you can dry them, but we're not gonna talk about that because the other food preparation techniques are pretty lengthy, but we're just gonna talk about what to do uh, with the refrigerator or the freezer. So for freezing, what you wanna do is you wash the herbs, you remove the woody stems, especially the ones uh, from um, thyme or rosemary, you chop them and then you add them to an ice cube tray and then you fill it with water or broth. You can use chicken broth or vegetable broth, and then you freeze. And once they're frozen, then you can transfer them to a labeled freezer bag and you can just pop one uh, to your recipe or two, depending on how much the recipe needs. So with regards to other vegetables that you generally store at a room temperature, like garlic and onion and so forth, you wanna keep the garlic, onion, and potatoes in a well-ventilated ven area and away from sunlight. Um, <clears throat> unless they have been um, cut up or peeled, um, they're really better at room temperature, 50 to 60 degrees. So your basement will be great. It's generally cool and dry there. Uh, if you're storing your vegetables in basements, provide your vegetables with ventilation, as I said. Um, <clears throat> These vegetables are not dead. They still breathe and require oxygen to maintain their high quality. And also remember to protect them from rodents or other pests. If you have a root cellar, they also provide cold and moist conditions. As with basements, provide ventilation and protection from rodents and other pests when storing them in cellars. You can use materials such as straw, hay, or wood shavings for insulation. If using such insulation, make sure that it's clean and not contaminated with pesticides. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a minute just in case anybody has any question. Okay, so the next 
topic is going to be cleaning. So obviously, the purpose of cleaning is not just to remove the visible dirt and soil, which do not look good and do not taste good, but also to remove and reduce harmful microorganisms. In order for us to keep the food safe for our vegetables, we want to, one, limit the quantity that we're getting. If we are purchasing vegetables, limit the amount, uh, since many vegetables um, can only be stored for some days. However, of course, onions, potatoes, and winter squash, butternut squash, for example, can last much longer at appropriate temperatures. You want to start clean. Cleanliness and safe produce go hand in hand. So before preparing fruits and vegetables, always wash your hands well with soap and water. Clean your countertops, cutting boards, and utensils with hot soapy water before peeling or cutting your produce. Bacteria from the outside of raw produce can be transferred to the inside when it is being cut or peeled. And then wait to wash. Washing produce before storing may promote bacterial growth and speed up spoilage. So it's often recommended to wait and wash fruits and vegetables just before use. So this uh, generally soil has been removed from fresh produce when you buy them from the grocery store. But if they came from your yard, they might be, they might be really full of soil and everything. So you may cho choose, excuse me, you may choose to wash them before storing. If you are washing them before storing, you wanna dry thoroughly with clean paper towels. The excess moisture or water will make your produce get moldy quicker. Here, this one is a video um, on how to properly clean your kitchen before we work on our vegetables. This one is from Ohio State University. Hey, I'm Leslie Fisher and I'm a student at The Ohio State University. Recently, I've been working with some researchers who are studying ways to clean and sanitize kitchens using common household products. As you can see, my kitchen is disgusting. I have some friends coming over for a party and I don't want anyone to get sick. So, here we go. Now this kitchen may look clean, but it's not. Bacteria like E. coli or salmonella can hang out on the countertops or other surfaces. If food touches these surfaces, the bacteria can be transferred to the food. Then you leave the food sitting out and unrefrigerated conditions are perfect for the bacteria to multiply. So to reduce these germs to a safe level so that no one gets sick, we need to sanitize. All you need to do is spray any surfaces that the food might touch with a sanitizing solution. Surfaces like the countertop, the stovetop, or the sink. Then, let the solution air dry, or you can clean it up with a clean paper towel. Sanitizing solutions can be made from products you probably already have lying around. All of these products are safe for food. The easiest and most effective is a solution of chlorine bleach and water. Just add one teaspoon chlorine bleach to one quart of water, mix, and spray. The solution must remain in contact with the surface for one minute. Extra solution can be stored in a dark place and thrown out after one week. If you don't have bleach, you can also use undiluted hydrogen peroxide or white distilled vinegar. For maximum effectiveness, these products should be heated to 130 degrees Fahrenheit in a saucepan. They must remain in contact with the surface for at least one minute. These products can also be used at room temperature, but they must remain in contact with the surface for at least 10 minutes. Now my kitchen is clean and sanitized. You can find out more information about food safety at foodsafety.osu.edu. Or... Okay. Does anybody have any question? Okay. Is there a substitute for a two-piece blanching pan? Yes, you can just use any pan essentially. Um, that one was just really convenient because you can put the vegetable in that perforated steamer pan and then take it out like that. But you can just use any pan and you can just dump it through a colander or use a, um, um, a, a sieve, a sieve and, and just dump them through a sieve and, and that would be fine too. Anything, it's, it's good.
Um, any other question? Okay, we're moving on. So uh, this is the chart that talks about basically the latter part of what she mentioned on um, how effective these household sanitizing agents are. Make sure to use chlorine bleach that has 6% sodium hypochlorite. That's the uh, active ingredient in there. It should show on the label. Bleach that does not have that label, such as some of the ones from a dollar store may not have the right concentration. Same with the other agents, hydrogen peroxide has to be 3% concentration and the distilled vinegar should be at least 5%. Now, chlorine, as was mentioned in the video as well, is the easiest and least expensive option of all common household sanitizing agents. Vinegar is also effective, uh, but you have to heat it up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit um, because at room temperature, vinegar and then also hydrogen peroxide, they don't kill Listeria monocytogenes. And that is the bacteria that just got uh, the outbreak in the news, if, I don't know if you've heard of the news in April, it was the Dole um, salad greens, I think, right? There was about 20 people that got sick, 18 people got hospitalized, about three people died. And then last month, I believe it was some ice cream in Florida, same thing, about 20, 23 people got sick, 22 people got hospitalized one died and one miscarriage. And that's the thing about Listeria is that it's really uh, terrible for pregnant women because it can cause miscarriage. So um, anyway, you'll be able to get, to get a copy of this and how to properly clean the kitchen also later on. Let me see, chat. Uh, can you repeat the bleach water ratio? It was a teaspoon of bleach to one quart of water. Will end of the cleaning solutions mentioned hurt quartz or? Oh, will they hurt quartz or granite? Um, I'm not sure about quartz. Granite, no. Um, definitely not granite. I, I'm not very familiar with quartz. Does anybody know? I can look that up um, and find out. But if anyone knows, I'd appreciate that too. If not, I'd be happy to look that up. Okay, great questions. <clears throat> so with regards to cleaning our vegetables, no washing method completely removes or kills all microbes which may be present on the produce. However, studies have shown that thoroughly rinsing fresh produce under running water is an effective way to reduce the number of microorganisms. Washing fruits and vegetables not only helps remove dirt, bacteria, and stubborn garden pests, but it also helps remove some residual pesticides. Don't wash fruits and vegetables with detergent or bleach solutions. Many types of fresh produce are porous and could absorb these chemicals. Chemical rinses and other treatments for washing raw produce, they're usually called fruit wash or vegetable wash, they are often advertised as the best way to keep fresh fruits and vegetables safe, but the FDA advises against them because the safety of the residue from them has not been evaluated and their effectiveness has not been tested or standardized. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is cleaning green leafy vegetables and herbs. And basically you just wanna thoroughly rinse them under running water, but I have a video here. Let's see, all right. All right, so you wanna wash them under running water. Make sure to wash the lower part of the stem that part is usually full of soil since it's submerged as a plant while it was growing. Now leaves can be difficult to clean, so immersing the leaves in a bowl of water for a few minutes can help loosen sand and dirt. 
Now, other vegetables like leeks, for example, you really have to open the whole thing. Expose each layer of the vegetable because the dirt or soil is embedded in each layer, on each layer. Now, if you are immersing in water, a clean bowl is a better choice than the sink. Okay, so if you're immersing them in the water, uh, in water, a clean bowl is a better choice than the sink because the drain area often harbors microorganisms. Now, these are very short videos, and especially if you're getting your vegetables from your yard, they're probably a bit more um, full of soil, so you probably have to run them under running water a little bit longer and maybe... Um, if you're immersing them in water, you probably have to do that twice or three times. The ones from the store, they have been pre-cleaned a little bit, so they're not quite as full of soil. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the thing about immersing them in a clean bowl, my suggestion is to use the largest bowl that you can get or a really deep container. You fill it up with water and then you put your vegetables there, um, especially greens, and if they're lettuces sometimes in the restaurant actually they get chopped first before they get washed they get chopped and then you put them in that water and swish them around and then you lift the vegetables from the water and all the dirt will be left on the bottom part of the bowl and you can do that a couple of times until it's nice and clear you can also add vinegar to the water half a cup of distilled white vinegar white vinegar per one cup of water and then you rinse the whole thing with clean water now this has been shown to reduce bacterial contamination but then it may affect texture and taste now i like to do this with um cantaloupe because you know how there's that very rough surface and there's been a lot of outbreaks with cantaloupe and and you're not going to eat the peel anyway so therefore it doesn't matter if there's vinegar on the outside so anyhow after washing make sure to blot dry with paper towels or use a salad spinner to remove the excess moisture make, if you don't remove the excess moisture the greens will decay faster and get moldy <clears throat> Oops. Let's see. Okay. Now this one is cleaning vegetables with a hard rind or skin. So what we want to do is to scrub them under running water. The water should be no more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the vegetable. <laughs> So we wash water, as I said, should be no more than 10 degrees cold in the produce to prevent the entrance of microorganisms into the stem or blossom end of the produce. And you can wash under lukewarm running water as well. The rough netted surfaces of some types of melon like cantaloupe, as I mentioned, they provide an excellent environment for microorganisms that can be transferred to the interior during cutting. So to minimize the risk of cross-contamination, use a vegetable brush and wash melons thoroughly under running water before peeling or slicing. Next, we have cleaning firm produce like cucumbers and also fruits like apples. Okay, so some of these vegetables like cucumbers and, and, and then fruits like apples, they have a waxy thing on the outside. So if you use warmer water, the wax will come off easier, but wash them well. 
so you can get rid of that. Okay, next. Now, these are not vegetables, these are fruits, but I thought I'll throw them in anyway. We wanna wash grapes, cherries, and berries because they're fragile, pretty gently under running water. If you need to store them, um, as was mentioned, it's better to wash them right before you're gonna eat them. But then if you have, if for some reason you need to store them, then you wanna make sure that you dry them thoroughly. Okay, whether you are storing them unwashed or washed, make sure to separate and discard spoiled or moldy fruit before storing to prevent the spread of the spoilage microorganisms. And last but not least is the cleaning of mushrooms. So with mushrooms, we actually wipe it with wet paper towel. So you can also use a soft brush or like in the video, wipe with a wet paper towel to remove the dirt. Okay, let me look at the chat if we have any questions or uh, let's see, I'm gonna go up and see. We got to the very top. All right, hang on a minute. Uh, Can you wash watermelon and cantaloupe, cantaloupe rinds with soap and water before cutting? Are the rinds porous like other fruits and vegetables? Um, they do not recommend using soap before cutting because they are indeed porous. <coughs> I imagine it will not penetrate if you wash them real fast all the way in since you're not really eating the rind. Nevertheless, it's something that's not recommended with regards to using soap. Um, you can use um, a combination of half a cup of distilled vinegar and one cup of water instead. That's what they recommend. Okay, looks like we have hydrogen peroxide is safe for granite if used occasionally, but it is a weak acid so it can dull the polish. Bleach is also safe for sealed granite, but not a full strength, one teaspoon per quart of water. Uh, vinegar is more acidic and can cause more dulling or etching into the surface, so you might use more caution with vinegar. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. That's awesome. Yeah, you don't want to have a too strong of a concentration of bleach anyway because it's toxic. Uh, let's see, what's the best way? Oh, sorry. Just to add on to that, Sheila, um, as I was doing some research, it said that, you know, your granite should be sealed, your countertop should be sealed well. Um, and if you start to see that the water is no longer beating up on your granite or quartz countertop, then it might need to be reseal resealed. And that information is more for granite than it is quartz. I'm still looking up info on quartz. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Great information. Um, I did not know that about the, the beating of the water. That's something I need to check. Um, what's the best way to clean broccoli? So broccoli has a tendency occasionally um, to have mud in between those florets. So what you want to do is to kind of just kind of pry them a little bit like this to make sure that you're washing in between those florets. I had a terrible experience one time where there was still mud in there from a restaurant. In fact, you know, uh, you don't think that there's going to be mud there because it's not really, it didn't grow in the soil, the head is, is not actually in the soil, but somehow maybe it was muddy day, I don't know, but definitely kind of just pry them like this um, to, and then use running water. Is granite itself toxic? Um, well, I've never heard of granite being toxic. Um, in fact, in, um, in the world of, 
candy making and chocolate making. Granite as well as marble is used extensively for because it's cool. So way they can cool uh, chocolate and granite. They also sometimes use it for their different sugar and sugar type candies. Um, you know, it cools it down while they're pulling it or, you know, doing taffy or whatever. So I've never heard of granite being toxic. If anybody else have any uh, um, information about that, that'd be great too. Uh, okay. All right. I think that's all the questions that we have. All right. So we're going to move on to preparing. Okay, now I'm going to show four easy breezy techniques for preparing vegetables. Hope you'll try them. Uh, the first one is kale chips. Kale chips has become really popular in recent years, but you can actually make them in the microwave oven. And especially now it's summer, it's pretty hot. You probably don't want to turn on your oven. Here's a great technique. Let's see. <laughs> Crunchy. Okay, so uh, if you like spicy food, you can also mix a little bit of cayenne pepper or crushed red pepper flakes with the salt. You can place the crushed pepper flakes in a spice grinder so it can disperse easily with the salt and then you use that as your seasoning so you have spicy kale chips as well. Okay. Oops. Next one over here is uh, braised greens. So in this demo, we're going to see how to braise greens. In particular, this will be rainbow chard.
braised greens are a great vegetable side dish because uh, for me, because they keep well, um, unlike say sauteed asparagus or broccoli, they tend to be overcooked if they are reheated the following day. These greens, when they're braised, they are pretty much the same texture and flavor the next day. You can also use kale or collard greens. Kale will take a little bit longer to soften or be a bit more tender. So you may have to add more liquid and you can just add more of that vinegar that they used or water. Um, collard greens will take a lot longer, 45 minutes or 60 minutes to soften. Um, personally, I like Swiss chard. It cooks faster. It has a relatively mild flavor. It's easier to feed your family with it. Um, kale sometimes can turn a little bitter when they are cooked for too long. Um, <clears throat> But if you don't like the flavor of something that's sour, you can also use chicken broth instead or vegetable broth for a vegetarian option. You can also substitute olive oil or canola oil for a healthy, less saturated version instead of the coconut oil in the recipe, in the video. Okay, let's see. So, I'm gonna look at the chat again. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, definitely uh, find out from your um, granite supplier if they have uh, any of, <clears throat> if you have concerns about the safety of granite. As I said, I'm not familiar with that uh, being toxic, being that it's used pretty extensively in the um, confectionery industry, the chocolate and sugar industry, but definitely no harm in really making sure that's definitely the best way to go. Um, Amy has provided a link to counter stop, countertops. Awesome. Thank you, Amy and Allison also for helping people often. Wait, I can't read. Let's see. People who walk through gardens to eat the vegetables right from the garden, including those grown organically. How is it that they're not getting sick from microorganisms? Um, well, I would say it's just, um, you know, a matter of chance. It's a matter of chance. It doesn't mean that everything in the in you know in the garden actually has microorganisms that's harmful. Also, that you're eating enough of it to make you sick. Um, but also, it depends on who's eating their immune system. If they're very young, very old, immune compromised system, they're undergoing chemotherapy or whatever, then you might get sick a lot easier. So there are so many factors really there for not getting sick. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like just a chance that you're taking. Uh, video volume is a little high. Okay, I'll lower that. Uh, is it true that how food is presented is, is it true that how food is presented is a grocery store, for example, is how we are supposed to store at home as well? For example, fruits, apples, oranges, lemons can be left on countertop and not in the fridge. Yeah, in some way. Yeah. For the most part. Did you answer the question about how to clean broccoli? Yes. Yeah, so for the broccoli, you want to wash it under running water. And you know how they're, they have florets, just kind of pry them a little bit open like this to make sure that there's no soil or dirt <clears throat> in between those. And then um, sometimes you can even after you've cut them into florets, you can wash them again um, so that you can really get into that. Um, how to prepare wild spinach or uh, in parsley? I am not familiar with wild spinach or purslane, but I'm happy to look that up. Uh, if anybody else has more information, feel free to share. Okay, otherwise I'm gonna move on to, oops, the next one here. Okay, this one is the easy garlic and ginger bok choy. Now, <clears throat> here we go.
Okay, so um, you can substitute canola oil or any other vegetable oil in this recipe. You can also use other Asian greens if you happen to pass by an Asian supermarket. You can also use regular broccoli or broccolini, some of those other broccoli variations you see in the grocery store. Instead of soy sauce, you can also use oyster sauce. Um, you can even add roasted sesame oil in addition to the sesame seeds to bring out an even stronger sesame flavor if you like. Use low sodium soy sauce if you are watching your sodium intake and for those cooking for household members with hypertension or high blood pressure. And the very last preparation technique I have here is cooking frozen vegetables in the microwave. I'm here in the kitchen at Colorado State University, and I'm going to show you how to cook frozen vegetables in the microwave. So you're going to start with your bag of frozen veggies, and this is corn, carrots, peas, and green beans. I'm just going to cut it open. Right, microwave safe bowl here. That's fine. And depending on how many you're cooking, um, this is about three servings, so I'm going to do about three tablespoons of water. Just pour that in, and this will allow them to steam a little bit. And then you're going to cover. Um, you can put plastic wrap or cover with a plate, and I'm going to cover my bowl with a plate. And then we're going to go over to the microwave here. And place it in the microwave. And then they're probably going to cook for about four minutes total. So I'm going to do two minutes and then I'm going to stir them and then two more minutes. So I just took the veggies out of the microwave and I stirred them halfway through. And to know that they're cooked, they should be hot throughout, but um, a little bit steamy and definitely still have their bright colors. So here you can see like that. And afterwards, you can serve them however you like, either plain or put butter on them. And it's as simple as that. Okay, so it's already one o'clock, so I'm gonna speed up really quick here. This is actually my very, well, my, nearly my last slide. I just wanted to mention that you can also add no salt or low sodium vegetable or chicken broth instead of the water to give the vegetables flavor. That way you can, um, Instead of adding butter at the end, you can skip the butter, especially if you're preparing food for household members who have hypertension or high blood pressure and they can't have a lot of that saturated fat. Um, I have here the next, it's just recap. So I'm gonna speed through that and I just wanna show you this one. Um, this is the uh, the link so you can get the hands out handouts and then over here is the QR codes if you want to scan that you can get the um, all the handouts that I have for today a copy of the slides here also the links to all these videos and so forth also a copy of um, how to clean your kitchen the temperature humidity of your fruits and veggies and so so forth so they're they're all there you can just scan this QR code also my upcoming classes is going to be in this web page over here you can just scan it with your QR code as well so having said that let me see uh Great place to find videos from CSU Extension on Cleaning Produce is on foodsmartcolorado.colostate.edu. Awesome. Um, washing broccoli is also there. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And we carried over for a minute. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much, Sheila. Great class. Lots of good information there.